It had hair all over its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature, and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guessed around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot near to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Richard today. Richard, how are you? I'm doing really well, thank you. I'm battling a little bit of a cold that I've had this past week, so I hope you'll bear with me a little bit on this. Um, let's just get right to it then. Um, tell me when... You had your first encounter, and just kind of walk me through everything that's happened since then. Okay. Um, actually, my first encounter was I found a, a footprint. I was setting up a hunting blind in northern Idaho, and that overlooked a water hole. And I brought my wife and my son with me. It was lot, it was way before the hunting season started, and I set this blind up, and and I walked down to the pond to sort of check it out, see what kind of animals were there, because there was mud around the edges. And I got down there, and I saw there was just elk and deer tracks everywhere, so I started to skirt the left side of the pond, and, and I come up upon this track, and I just it just totally flabbergasted me, because I've always kind of believed in Bigfoot, but when I saw that track, it just it completely cemented the, the whole idea. It, it was an amazing track. The toes, you know, all of that is it. It was the real deal. And I turned and looked at my wife, and I said, "Honey, come down here. Bring me, bring the camera, please." And she came down, and I took pictures of it. And and that was that was it was an incredible track. So to fast forward from there, I went. Um, I was heading to uh, the casino up by Warley, Idaho. And I, that's where I saw my first sighting. Um, I was on my way to bet the Kentucky Derby, and it was the first Saturday in May in 2014. And as I was driving along the road up there by Tensid, I uh, I always look into the meadows as I'm driving by. There's, you know, there's little finger meadows that go off, you know, in the timbered area. And I just, I just always look in there just to see what type of game I can see. And right on the top right corner, up on this top of this little meadow, with that's fenced. It was fenced in. I saw what I believed to be was a Sasquatch. It was very tall, reddish brown, rusty color. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I, pardon me. Yeah, yeah. And and as soon as I saw it, I uh, I I pulled over and I go, what in the heck was that? And and my wife goes, what? What'd you see? And I go. 
think I just saw a Sasquatch. And, and I turned around and I came back and pulled over and parked and got out of the car and looked up and, and it was gone. So whatever I saw there saw me pull around and, and it took off. So I, I started doing research on that and, and it seems like maybe 70 or 80 percent of Bigfoot sightings come from cars when people are out driving around. Yeah, and, it's about 70 uh, percent along roads. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I found in <clears throat> in my research also is that that's about seventy percent of all sightings are just like what I had. So um, later on that October, that I was getting ready to go elk hunting up in up near Beauville, Idaho, and I have a favorite spot that I like to go to, and I back my trailer in there, and it's an open trailer. I it, there's no roof on it or anything. It's just one of those little utility trailers. I use it to haul my deer out, and I, I sleep in it overnight. But I got up there the, the night before elk season started, and I set my camp up and was hanging out by myself because I, I hunt by myself. I know a lot of people don't think it's it's a wise idea, but I am way more successful doing it. And uh, I was born and raised or not born in Alaska, but I was raised in Alaska and, and I've, I, I know, you know, my way around the woods quite a bit. So I'm, <clears throat> I had a couple of beers and I crawl into my sack and I'm laying there and I fall asleep and about well, maybe two or three in the morning, um, the, the alpha male, I, from what I believe he, what he was, he cut loose with a T-Rex scream less than 100 feet from my trailer. And I could feel the vibrations from his uh, volume. I mean, it, it, I could feel it laying down in my trailer. And so I sat up and I grabbed my rifle and I'm looking around I'm like, what in the heck was that? And... It, it was it was amazing. The just this sheer volume and power of that scream was just gosh, just it, it frightened me. And I I laid there until daybreak. I did not get out of my trailer until there was a little bit of light coming up. And when I got up, I looked around and I was like, I I'm getting out of here. So I just uh, packed everything up and and I drove back to Lewiston because I did not know what that was. I started to listen to Bigfoot screams. Uh, you know, I got a hold of some of Ron Moorheads and that Ohio scream, and mm-hmm. and, and I listened to a, a bunch of them. And then when I hit found that T Rex, it was that was it. It was it was identical to that one. It was just amazing. It the was length of like, the scream. Nothing Pardon like me? any of the, nothing like any of the recordings you heard. Um, it, it it was it was a, it was kind of like the Ohio scream. It had that that long that long drawn out ah you know and then it dropped and then the volume dropped but it, it, it a, was uh, it scared yeah it oh. scared the heck out of me it really did it was, it was just um, the one vocal just the one vocal yes it night. was yeah it's, just it one sounds... I'm sorry go ahead he just he just ripped it out it sounds kind of like a a roar and then right. it goes into a scream. You know, ah, and then, then that long, drawn out scream. It was, it was, uh, it was powerful. I couldn't I, believe it. I, I can relate. I've heard the same thing up in the Olympic Mountains in Washington. Um, there were some noises back in the early '70s from Snohomish, Washington, that were that sound very much like what you're describing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I've had so many. Um, encounters that I did not have an audio recorder on me, and I am kicking myself to this day for not getting one earlier than that. Because oh my word, some of the stuff I've heard it's it's just unbelievable, you know. And, and I carry one now wherever I go. I, I've got one in my pocket all the time. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I sure missed out on a lot of opportunities, but heck, there's there's always the future. There's always a chance that it'll happen again. Absolutely. This, this place, yeah, yeah. This place that I is now my main research area. It, it is really rich and and hot in in evidence. Um, I it always seems that I run into them when I go up there. I've kind of figured out their patterns of of uh, movement. There's a large reservoir nearby, and they hang out there during the summertime. 
And then they, in the fall, they move over to where my hunting camp was set up, and they, they kind of make a circular pattern. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. There, there are, uh, I'd say there's probably four or five members of this clan. That's what I, I from the footprints I've found. Mm-hmm. I've, and, and I've gone, I found um, footprints in the snow. <clears throat> I uh, I busted up there in the middle of winter in a February, and it was my truck was the only tires tracks through this road. I mean, uh, I was in four wheel drive and on low, and I just barely made it back in there. Mm-hmm. And I got out and I saw this trackway. I saw some tracks running along the fence line, so I walked over to it, and boy, it was a uh, was some pretty big, pretty big tracks. Nice ones, about 17 inches, probably by eight or nine inches wide. Right. And I stomped my I stomped my foot down next to it and took a picture of that. And it went along the fence line and then crossed over and went back into the into the woods. But I've got pictures of all of that. I try and take photographic evidence as much as I can. So right. I'll, I'll a carry a, a yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a good plan. It's if you you can hide a camera in your hand that you know. Oh, I've yeah. taken some some pretty nice pretty nice pictures of structures in that area that pretty impressive there's a, a nice have to come a nice visit you <laughs> oh you should hell oh my gosh um i i could show you this area and and it's it's really really hot it's i, I get tree knocks every time i stop and um i've heard i heard their language spoken a couple of different times it's it's um, pretty cool. I wish I had my audio at that time when I didn't. But yeah, they were less than mm, probably a hundred feet from me when there was a sentinel up in the top of a tree. And my wife and I were on a deer hunting trip because I figured uh, the stupid me, you know, I say it's a road that runs through the middle of a uh, thick forest, and all of my action was on the right side of the road. I had never thought about going on the left, and I thought, oh, okay, it's safe to go in there and deer hunt because everything is on the right side. Well, I walked down this little forest service road that's been overgrown with my wife, and we were looking for deer, and they came up around this corner, and, and uh, they like to imitate crows, loud, loud cawing, mm-hmm. and I come up around this corner and it, I must have surprised him because he was up in the tree and he just started crowing like crazy and then a couple of really panicky wood knocks bang bang and then he he, they, he said something in his language and I, you know it was so rapid fire that it, I, I caught it but my wife didn't you know because she she was on the deer hunting mode she wasn't thinking about birds but as soon as I heard the volume of that crow sound I knew exactly what it was and and I stopped and, and I go, did you hear that? And and she goes, what? But I go, that crow. Did you hear that crow? And I go, that's not a crow. And she, I go, just listen for a minute. And then in a little while, a few seconds later, a real crow crowed. He was off in the distance. But I go, oh, there. See, that was a real crow. Now listen for a minute. And she's sitting there listening. And then he, the sentinel, crowed again. But it was like, caw, caw. You know, it was it was a gravelly voice, and it was. It was a nice try, but it wasn't fooling me. So I, I kind of looked down and I go, they're here. And she, what? And I, Sasquatch, they're here. They're right here. So mm-hmm. let's just keep going. I said, let's just keep going. So we walked on further, and she started hearing some wrestling on the left. And then the in front of us, probably another 75 to 100 feet, another really loud crow crowed again. So I, I I know that they like to get you into triangles. You know, they like right. to get you into a triangulation. Well, we were standing right in the middle of the triangle. And I, I kind of looked around, and and my wife was like, let's get out of here. And I go, well, let's, let's just wait a minute. No, let's see what's, what's going on. And she goes, no, no, I don't, I don't want to get hurt. Let's get out of here. And I go, ah, okay. Well, so we uh, carefully backed out, and they were crowing all this time. So as soon as we got past that sentinel in the tree, we got past him, everything stopped. And then we walked on out to the truck and got in and left. That that was the first time I actually heard their language. And, and it was it's impressive when you hear it. You know, 
in in the real, you know, in the, in nature. It's it's quite interesting. I I could make out syllables and um, some, you know, they're it, it was so fast though that your 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 ear and your mind has a hard time keeping up with it. Right. But uh, you know, it it sounds like it's being slurred in a weird way. Yeah, that was that was something else. That was and um and right after that, that was in October, late October. And then I, I hunted all the um in November and then in December I decided that um I had an extra day and I dropped my son off at school and, and we took uh, my daughter and, and my wife and we drove back up down the road and this time I said, Well, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm going to put some miles between that spot and where I want to hunt because I, I want to see if I can't find something. So I knew this other Forest Service road, and I par- I backed in, parked it, and I left my wife and my daughter in my truck, and it was, I just wanted to go for a quick little look. And I walked down that road, and I was following somebody's footprints. It, it was it was about a, an inch and a half of snow on the ground, and I followed this guy's tracks along, and, and there was a ravine with some water running on the left, and it was kind of a slope, a slope on the right side that was heavily altered, but there was there was thick trees everywhere, and I followed this guy's tracks down the road, and I know that at the end of this area, there's a, kind of like a, a, a big opening <clears throat> that <clears throat> that somebody had put a uh, salt lick on, and I was just going to go go down there and kind of see if I couldn't jump something. So as I get down to that little opening, I'm hearing this little tapping sound, tap, 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 tap. And, and I stop and I look around. And I, I kind of figured out where that tapping sound was coming from. And I looked up and I, I thought to myself, woodpecker? You know, and, and, then it, and then it started tapping again. And this time I could discern that it was wood on wood. It was like, mm-hmm. beep, 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 beep. but it was real light. You know, it wasn't a loud tapping sound. It was a real light sound. So I go, oh, okay, I know what that is. So I bent down. Big mistake. Big mistake. Never do it again. Bent down, picked up a, a large club-like branch that was laying on the ground, and I walked over to this tree, big, nice nice size tree, and I just laid into it. Pow! Just hit that tree with that thing as hard as I could. And the opposite hillside, just blew up. He he was mad. He was growling. He was like, rawr, rawr, like that, that growl that they make when they're mm-hmm. build, trying to build themselves up. And he starts coming down that hillside, just snapping branches. And I, oh my God, what did I do there? You know, and, and I, and I, I looked at my rifle and I got a little six millimeter with three shells in it. And I go, no, nah, that's oh not going to work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, <laughs> that's not going to work. So, so I just sort of, um, I threw my hands up in the air and said, okay. And I turned around and I started walking. I mean, my mind is telling me, and my, my legs are telling me, run, 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 run. And then my mind kicked in and said, no, nope, don't do it. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to trigger that predatory response. Right. So, oh yeah, you know, you've ever rolled a ball across the floor for a cat, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah, it will pounce. And and I think that Sasquatch does the same thing. You just can't, they might not kill you, but... It's like with gorillas, you want, you want to stand your ground. Right. So I turned my back on him, and I walked slowly. And, and I it was hard to keep my legs from moving faster, but I made this concerted effort to slow my walk down and as I was walking out I was looking over my shoulder but something paralleled me on my left side as I was walking back toward the truck and I had a good three quarters of a mile walk so and it, it, it wasn't like it was just right around the corner I, I had to keep my composure and I walked down there and something followed me all the way to the truck I could hear it coming through the brush it was probably you know 50 feet up above me and that brush is so thick, you can't see, you know, 20 feet into it. And as soon as I got to my truck, I threw that, I still had that club, and I threw that club into the back of my truck and hopped in and put my rifle away and looked at my wife and go, you won't believe what just happened. And, and then I told her on the way 
as I was driving back to Lewis. And that that's that's the two the two times that that they got pretty aggressive. And then I was in I was in close, and they were they were all the way around me. But I think that if you just keep your composure, you you you'll be okay. Is that is that something that sounds familiar? Yeah, I, absolutely. It's what I do in the field. If there's anything going on, I just maintain my composure, and usually it, it gets diffused pretty quickly. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That clan that I've been interacting with, they uh, I, I pick apples, and and it's always wild apples. I never take um, store bought apples uh, up there, and. Uh, the the apple tree is probably two or three miles away, so I'm I'm having a feeling that you know they know where that tree is too. But I am using these, I'm using their apples kind of as, as a gift, but sort of saying here's here's some some apples. You know, it's not mm-hmm. I'm not habituating. I don't I don't like that whole idea. Yeah, I, I won't either. give them anything. I don't. I don't do that. I use their wild. I use their natural food source to to make an offering to them. You know, I'm trying to get them to where they'll be relaxed and actually show themselves to me because that's what I I want. You know, I, I'm trying to get them to where they can trust me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go into I go in there usually without a firearm because I think that that deters an awful lot of stuff that could happen. The the apples that I have put out, they, they've all been taken. And a couple of times when I've come back to check up on it, uh, one time I, I pulled in, and I'm sure that they know the sound of my truck. Because I've been in and out of there now. Um, it's been over, it's been about five years. I've probably been in and out of there, you know, a hundred times. And I, I'm sure, I'm sure they know what my truck sounds like. And sure. when I started to pull, yeah, I think they can hear it from miles away. So when I get in there, one time I I walked up to the apple pot, and it was pretty depleted, but there was still a few left, and one of them still had bite marks in it. it looked like they were small mouth, a small mouth, mm-hmm. um, juvenile. And the ju- yeah, it was. I think it was the juvenile that I seen the footprints, and and the uh, the juice was still running out of the bite. Did you take pictures was, of the apple? Yes, I did. I'd love to see your pictures. Yeah, um, in that same area, uh, in the snow time. So yeah, I, I had saved some apples. I, I picked them off that wild tree, and I um, saved them for, like, the winter time. And I took them back there right after the first snow and put them right down there. And I thought, okay, here you go. Here's one last, uh, one last apple treat for you before, you know, winter's gone. Well, I came back, and it looked like they'd used those apples that I placed out to draw deer in, because there was uh, some tracks that showed these tracks coming in, and then a big scuffle mark just passed. I, I took pictures of all of this, and a big scuffle mark, and then the deer tracks were gone, and I... I got some pictures of pug marks where their front hands were on the ground as they ran. Walking you you can see the knuckle. Running yeah, on walking fours, on yes. all fours. Yes, yeah. I have pictures of that. And oh, those, awesome. Those, yeah, with the knuckles, you know, knuckle marks in the snow and that. I've, Yeah, I'll have to send you those. Those are, those are cool. Absolutely. It's the only, yeah, only, only documented knuckle marks that I've found so far. Yep. It's it's not something that's very well talked about or known, and um, you know it's something we definitely need to watch for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I I think you can find them if you just do it right. You know. Yeah, I agree. There's a I I believe that they may they may chase on all fours. I, I'm you know maybe they ambushed them on all fours, but yeah that. That deer he came in there getting those apples, and he, his tracks disappeared. So they yeah. must have snatched him and picked him up. They got him, sure. Mm-hmm. And what was funny was is they they actually were smart enough to use the apples 
to lure the deer in, you know. Exactly. That's, See, that's, a, that's something that I was told by my, I don't know if you know about my uh, my contact, they call him Mr. Black. Uh, mm-hmm. He and... Uh, I, I, the, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that he and a couple of the other guys that, you know, my, my cop friend had the run-in with the feds, both said the mm-hmm. same thing independently, that they will bait other other game animals. I believe it. I I was just, you know, I was just using my logical sequences of what I saw in the evidence in the snow, and I knew that they did that. And yeah. that's that's the first time that I've ever seen it done or even heard of it done, And yeah. it, besides what you just said. So, wow, that's... That's some nice collaboration. We we had examples of, uh, and I'll give you one. Uh, it's a, it's a picture I'm putting in my my next book. It's a, of a deer that was hung up 11 feet in a tree. This is in uh, the Adirondack Mountains of New York, and it's mm-hmm. the second time it was done in a couple year time period. A nurse actually found this uh, hiking in the area, and when I contacted both of my sources independently. They said exactly the same thing. Yes, they will do this sometimes to bait. It, it sort of expands their food base by other animals yeah. being attracted to that one kill. Mm-hmm. Or in your wow. case, apples. Yeah, yeah, those are wild apples too, just a few yeah. miles away. Yeah, that's uh, that's really cool to hear. It, it's a very I, high I, degree of intelligence. Mm-hmm. I I believe these things are really intelligent. I do. I. I see a lot of uh, examples of it in their structures. You know, they they make some unbelievable structures. I've I've been um, this last year or so. I've expanded my territories. I've been going into Montana. I've been down to Yellowstone. I've got just uh, some fantastic pictures of structures in Yellowstone. I along the stretch of the road there, I, I counted 25 different structures just in like a five-mile stretch, and, and I knew I was in, in it, so I just started to slow down a little bit and look for something very unique. And when I, I found connect, it, I pulled up. Huh? I, should, I, should, I should connect you with, I have people in Idaho and Montana, and I should connect you mm-hmm. with them. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, investigated the Skalkahoe Pass, and I found what I believe is the largest X that, and that it's it's huge. It, it's sixty feet tall. It's and the the logs that it's made out of that you can tell that they were imported because there was a, a log that was laying on the ground that had had that split top that some trees have, and that one one of the X, base of the X was just squirreled, you know, screwed down into that that uh, split part. To hold it in place, it, it's cool. I took a picture of me. Or, do you know who Brian Sullivan is? No, I'm not familiar with him. Yeah, he, he's he's um, in Montana, and I took him to the X because I wanted somebody else to see to see it, and and he took a picture of me standing under it. But that's that's a, an amazing structure, and I found some other ones in the Skalkahoe area, so I know there's a lot of activity there too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with all of those fires that happened, you know, in, in and around Hamilton, that I'm sure a lot of uh, Sasquatch got displaced and pushed up and over the mountain on sure. toward the Phillipsburg, the Phillipsburg mm-hmm. side. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I've done I've done uh, Yellowstone. I've been Montana. I've done a little bit in Oregon, but not not a whole lot. And then um, I know it, up here in northern Idaho, there's a, a group that I call the Huckleberry Hill Clan, and mm. that's where I got my audio from. I have over six hours of audio. They walked right right up to my truck and were messing around with the audio and walking around it. You can hear them then chirping, and 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 um, then the alpha comes in and he's growling and he's just like tearing the heck out of trees. Let me and ask he, you. And then he. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I'll, I was just going to ask I'll you. I, I'm sure the the audience is interested in hearing some of that audio. Do you have a piece that you'd be willing to put with this recording? Yes, uh, actually, on my Facebook, um, I've made it public, and you anybody can go in and listen to it. It's about twenty twenty five minutes long, and it's loaded. And what's your Facebook page? It's uh, Richard Williams. Um, Lewiston, Idaho, and it has a picture of um, a 
one of those, you know, those painted rocks, you know, the craze is going around the United States of painting rocks. Well, I took one and I painted what a Bigfoot on it, and that's my uh, profile picture of my Facebook. Okay, well, folks, if you want to hear some of Richard's recordings, go to that page and check it out. Yes, it's it's really interesting. Uh, you'll like it. It, it. it says the the um, the clip at the top of it. It has my notes that I took a picture of, and it says Huckleberry One, and then it has a list of parts of where in the, uh, the audio of what minute is it's on and what is happening. There's screams, there's yells, there's tree breaks, there's whoops. It's it's pretty pretty cool, pretty cool. There's a lot on that six hours. I just took the the best 20 minutes of it that I thought would be the most interesting and, and posted that. Sure. Well, very interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah that, that Huckleberry Clan is a pretty pretty interesting group. They that I haven't really concentrated on on researching them, but every time I go there, I get I get uh, an encounter. Mm -hmm. I. I saw I saw something that I never thought I'd see. This year, we were up there picking berries, and I had picked the day before. And if you've ever done huckleberry picking, they're so oh, yeah. small and they're and it's tedious. It and takes I was a while. just sick of it. <laughs> oh my god! I picked for eight hours the day before, so I was just done with it. And my wife wanted to go back, so I said, "Okay, I'll be in charge of security. I'll just walk around the hill and just, you know, I'll keep the bears off you." You know, so take a break from it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I couldn't do it a second day. I just couldn't. It was uh, my eyes were crossing at the end of the day. <laughs> so I, and every time I looked up and I'd see another huckleberry plant loaded with berries, I'm like, oh god, you know. And then I'd Not have to go and clean it out. <laughs> Not another one. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I've done plenty myself. I, I can sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm giving her. Um, she's going up there. She's picking real good. I'm standing up on the side of the hill, and I took a a stick and I knocked the knocked on the side of the tree. And my wife looks up and she goes, "Are you crazy? Are you trying to call him in here?" And I <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I go, "Oops! Oh crap!" You know, I I just couldn't help it. And, you know, it's in my blood. I just want to see what's out there. So I stopped and I go, oh, I'm sorry, okay, I won't knock, but I might make a couple calls. And and she goes, oh, and then she went back and started picking. So I I crow called, did a couple of really good crow calls, and I'm standing there, and, I'm, and then off in the distance I hear this crow coming in. He's calling and he's moving in. And he flies right over this ravine on the right side because it drops down to the road. And then the, over the edge of that road, it drops down into the ravines where down at the bottom is the water source. And it comes swooping in. And I hear, oh, like that. And I could hear him coming. He was coming up the ravine from the water. And he he comes up and then he, he growls and he moves over. And I know that he knew that I, I drove the same truck that I had the year before when I got my audio. And I knew that he knew that that was my truck because he mm -hmm. comes and he parks himself right down <laughs> the bottom of the ravine right behind my truck. And he's down there growling. And then he stops. And that crow slaps its way back up towards um, where I am. And I get up on top of a stump so I can see better. So I climb up on this three-foot stump and I'm standing there. You know, that puts me up, you know. Maybe I'm six foot, so I'm I got a nine foot uh, clearance, and I'm looking down over the hill, and here comes this car. It drives along the road, and it goes right past us. And it goes on up, and then I hear it stop, and I hear the car door slam. And I'm standing up on that thing, that and I'm looking and looking, and then here comes this dog. He comes trotting down the, the road, and I think he smelled my chicken because we had some chicken that we were eating and we put it up on top of the truck up on the, the roof and he comes trot, trotting down there and he comes and he stops and he walks over to the edge of that ravine and looks down where that Sasquatch was, was uh, camped out at and that Squatch ripped off a growl at him and that dog turned and hightailed it back up that road. I mean, he spun and just 
just started digging and running. And I could not believe what I just saw. I looked at that and went, oh, my God, I got to see a, a dog get routed. You know, it, was, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. It was just like a, a front row seat. I just got to see it. So I was watching that dog and seeing which way he was going to go. And then he, he pulled in and he looked over the edge and, oh, man, he he, uh, he got scared. He took off. I, I saw the same thing with my own dog when I was 14, uh, 16. And uh, I don't wow. know if, if the Sasquatch has growled at him. I wasn't close enough yet to hear that. But he uh, he ran it before I had, right before I had my first sighting. He uh, ran up to the tree line. He stood there with his ears perked up, was rigid. Mm-hmm. And then he turned around and, and just tore back past me as fast as he could. So I am assuming something occurred there before I got within your uh, hearing range. Yeah. Yeah, it was a low guttural growl. It was like kind of like a wolf in a way. It was a like that. Yeah. You know, it, it was a low guttural growl. And so I'm standing there and I watched the dog run. And then that crow, he flies. He flies up into this tree just down below me about 50 feet. And I, I hop down and I walk over to my wife just to make sure everything's good. And I come back and I was heading back to that stump that I stepped off of. And I look down over the edge, and and now I'm three foot lower, but I can still, this, this crow was flapping his wings up and down like he was trying to fly. Hmm. And I'm looking at him, and, and I'm looking and looking, and I, I'm looking at his feet, and it looks like something had reached around the side of that trunk and had grabbed a hold of his feet. Because, you know, when you hold a chicken by its right. feet and it's flapping its wings that's what mm-hmm. the kind of the same thing I saw and I'm looking at that crow and I'm like what in the world is wrong with him and he's flapping and, it, and I, I, kind of, I look and I you know their their hair is such a color that it just blends into nature so well mm-hmm. you know you you know it's it's not like a, a red shirt sleeve around that side of that trunk it was but I could see something holding his feet because he just couldn't get his feet Right. Loose. And he was flapping, and, and then it, that that went on for about 30 seconds. And then then he got loose, and when he flew, he was flying. He was he was flying um, like he was hurt. You know, it was like, like, he had, like he'd been beat up or something. Mm-hmm. And he, because his, his, uh, his wings and the way he was gliding, he only glided. He went maybe, oh about 75 feet, and then he landed on the ground. And I, oh, wow, and I, I sort of walked up towards him, and I got up there. I couldn't see him. I just, I was looking for him. He was down in some brush, and then he recovered and got up and then flew off, but his flight path was pretty pretty shaky. It wasn't it wasn't a normal flight path because he, he had obviously went through something. I, I, I wish I knew what happened, but that's that's what I saw. And I, it looked like something grabbed him from behind that tree. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Not that particular sort of thing. Uh, it was interesting that he got away. Yeah, I don't know why. You know, um, maybe maybe he had some feathers plucked from him. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But the way he flew off, it was like. He was injured in a way, but not to where he still couldn't fly. Because I have a feather story that's pretty interesting. Okay. That 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 tree, that place that I um, give them apples at, the, the wild apples. Well, one time I pulled in and I walked down there to check see if everything was gone because I put toys out there too I'll throw a couple of cars or something like that and, and they've never touched them they they took one of the Legos one time and threw it about two or three feet away but that could have been anything it could have been a, a mouse or anything picked that up you, sure. you never can tell but um, I walked up to that that tree and there was a, a crow feather stuck into the tree and through a knot hole mm-hmm. and I took pictures of that I still have the feather. And I looked at it, and I go, oh, my word. And I go, there is no way in the world that a bird could have crashed into that 
and had that feather stuck in through that knot hole, and the way it was stuck in, I took pictures of it all. I'll send you that too. Okay. But that, that yeah, that feather was an interesting. Uh, it's the only time they've ever done anything like that, as far as I know. You know, because that's the only one I've ever found. But that crow feather, right at that tree that I've been gifting from, it, it's 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 not just a coincidence. It's I don't think it is. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, um, they are an interesting creature. They, I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, I, I have no clue. Um, but there it is. That's I found it, and it was right at the tree that I've been gifting at for quite a while. It's never been repeated. It's just it's only happened one time. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to hard to. Uh distinguish what it is they're doing i mean that's you know group by group whatever you know communication mm -hmm. things that they do I, I, themselves yeah i've i've got this rock thing that i do on the stumps out there there's a one stump that i line up five rocks on and um three separate times they've rearranged the rocks and i i have uh, pictures of all of that too Oh, very interesting. Three three separate times. Yeah. yeah. You got the before, yep. before they, and after pictures? Yes. Yep, I sure do. And mm -hmm. and every time every time I reset my rocks, I put them in a different pattern. And when I come back, they're in a different pattern. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I, it's happened to me three times. I've shown that to Ron Moorhead, and I've shown that to... Uh, I went to the International Bigfoot Conference two years ago, and I I took um, my portfolio there and showed them, let them listen to some of my audio. But yeah, uh, that that's that's an interesting thing. Uh, I I don't know what to make of it either. Uh, one of them, one of the arrange, rearrangements they did formed an X, and then one of the other rearrangements they made it it made kind of like a um, a J, hmm. and then the other, the third one was more of like a half moon uh, of rocks. They put it into a half moon shape, but every time, you know, it's it's all they've all been rearranged, and they haven't done it in oh, I'd say eight months now. Hmm. Maybe they're just out on their their trek, you know, where they go, their different, part different of the places range. they go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they might be in the different part of their range and haven't made it back to where I've got my rock set again. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those three different times, it's that's that's pretty cool. I I kind of would love to know what what their symbols mean, but I think it's going to take a lot of research to find that out. It'll it'll be in quite a few years before anything like that's known, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm I'm really glad I've got the pictures and, and the documentation so that I might be able to, in the future, know what it means. Yeah. Well, listen, we're running a little short on time. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm serious about coming and visiting you, by the way. I'm. I, you're well, more than welcome. We've got a lot of room. And I'm definitely going to have to have you. Going to have definitely have to have you back on. So thank you. I've got a lot more to tell you. <laughs> uh, great. Okay, Rick. And you. Well, let's definitely plan on that. You then. bet. Thank you. Well, listen, you have a good day, and uh, let's keep in touch, and we'll set up a second interview. Okay, thank you, Will. All you right. have a good day, too, and uh, and keep on squatching. All right, you too, my friend. Thank you. See Thanks, everyone, for joining me this week. Be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown. I kind of looked down and I go, they're here. And she's, what? I, Sasquatch, they're here. They're right here. So mm -hmm. let's just keep going. I said, let's just keep going. So we walked on further and she started hearing some wrestling on the left. And then the in front of us, probably another 75 to 100 feet, another really loud crow crowed again. So I, I, I know that they like to get you into triangles. You know, they like right. to get you into a triangulation. Well, we were standing right in the middle of the triangle. 
and I, I kind of looked around, and and my wife was like, "Let's get out of here." And I go, "Oh, let's, let's just wait a minute. You no, know, let's see what what's going on." And she goes, "No, no, I don't, I don't want to get hurt. Let's get out of here." And I go, oh, "Okay." Well, so we uh, carefully backed out, and they were crawling all this time. So as soon as we got past that sentinel in the tree, we got past him, everything stopped. And then we walked on out to the truck and got in and left. That that was the first time I actually heard their language. And, and it was it's impressive when you hear it, you know, in in the real, you know, in the, in nature, it's it's quite interesting. I I could make out syllables and um some you know, they're, it, it was so fast, though, that your, your, your ear and your mind has a hard time keeping up with it. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it sounds like it's being slurred in a weird way. Yeah, that was, that was something else. That was, and um, right after that, that was in October, late October. And then I, I hunted all the re- um, in November, and then in December, I decided that um, I had an extra day, and I dropped my son off at school, and, and we took uh, my daughter and, and my wife, and we drove back up down the road. And this time, I said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put some miles between that spot and where I want to hunt because I I want to see if I can't find something." So I knew this other Forest Service road, and I par- I backed in, parked it. And I left my wife and my daughter in my truck, and it was, I just wanted to go for a quick little look. And I walked down that road, and I was following somebody's footprints. It, it was there was about a, an inch and a half of snow on the ground, and I just followed this guy's tracks along. And, and there was a ravine with some water running on the left, and it was kind of a slope, a slope on the right side that was heavily altered, but there was there was thick trees everywhere. And I followed this guy's tracks down the road, and. I know that at the end of this area, there's a, kind of like a, a, a big opening <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that somebody had put a uh, salt lick on. And I was just going to go over club-like branch that was laying on the ground. And I walked over to this tree, big, nice and nice size tree, and I just laid into it. Pow! Just hit that tree with that thing as hard as I could. And the opposite hillside just blew up. He he was mad. He was growling. He was like rawr, rawr, like that that growl that they make when they're mm-hmm. build, trying to build themselves up. And he starts coming down that hillside just snapping branches. And I oh my God, what'd I do there? You know, and, and I and I, I looked at my rifle and I got a little six millimeter with three shells in it. And I go, No, nah, that's oh, not boy. gonna work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> not good. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> so so I just sort of, um, I threw my hands up in the air and said, okay. And I turned around and I started walking. I mean, my mind is telling me, and my, my legs are telling me, run, 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 run. And then my mind kicked in and said, no, nope, don't do it. You're, you're going to trigger that predatorial response. Right. So, oh yeah, you know, you've ever rolled a ball across the floor for a cat, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yep, it counts. And and I think that Sasquatch does the same thing. You just can't, they might not kill you, but... It's like with gorillas, you, mean, you, want, you want to stand your ground. Right. So I turned my back on him, and I walked slowly. And, and I it was hard to keep my legs from moving faster, but I made this concerted effort to slow my walk down and as I was walking out I was looking over my shoulder but something paralleled me on my left side as I was walking back toward the truck and I had a good three quarters of a mile walk so you know, it, it, it wasn't like it was just right around the corner I, I had to keep my composure and I walked down there and something followed me all the way to the truck I could hear it coming through the brush it was probably you know 50 feet up above me and that brush is so thick, you can't see, you know, 20 feet into it. As soon as I got to my truck, I threw that, I still had that club, and I threw that club into the back of my truck and hopped in and put my rifle away and looked at my wife and go, you won't believe what just happened. And and then I told her on the way as I was driving back to Lewis. And that, that's, that's the two, the two 
times that that they got pretty aggressive. And then I was in I was in close, and they were they were all the way around me. But I think that if you just keep your composure, you you you'll be okay. Is that is that something that sounds familiar? Yeah, absolutely. It's what I do in the field. If there's anything going on, I just maintain. Not to worry, still couldn't fly. Because I have a feather story that's pretty interesting. Okay. That 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 tree, that place that I um, give them apples at, the, the wild apples. Well, one time I pulled in and I walked down there to check see if everything was gone because I put toys out there too I'll throw a couple of cars or something like that and, and they've never touched them they they took one of the Legos one time and threw it about two or three feet away but that could have been anything it could have been a, a mouse or anything picked that up you, sure. you never can tell but uh, I walked up to that that tree and there was a, a crow feather stuck into the tree and through a knot hole mm-hmm. and I took pictures of that I still have the feather. And I looked at it, and I go, oh, my word. And I go, there is no way in the world that a bird could have crashed into that and had that feather stuck in through that knot hole and the way it was stuck in. I took pictures of it all. I'll send you that, too. Okay. But that, that yeah, that feather was an interesting, uh, it's the only time they've ever done anything like that. As far as I know, you know, because that's the only one I've ever found. But that crow feather, right at that tree that I've been gifting from, it is, it's it's not just a coincidence. It's, I don't think it is. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, they are an interesting creature. They, I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, I, I have no clue. Um, but there it is. That's, I found it, and... It was right at the tree that I've been gifting at for quite a while. It's never been repeated. It's just, it's only happened one time. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to uh, distinguish what it is they're doing. I mean, that's, you know, group by group, whatever, you know, communication mm-hmm. things that they do I've, I, themselves. Yeah. I've, I've got this rock thing that I do on the stumps out there. There's a one stump that I line up five rocks on and um, three separate times they've rearranged the rocks. And I, I have uh, pictures of all of that too. Oh, very interesting. Three, three separate times. Yeah. yeah. You got the before, yep. before they, and after pictures? Yes. Yep. I sure do. And, mm-hmm. and every time, every time I reset my rocks, I put them in a different pattern. And when I come back, they're in a different pattern. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, I, it's happened to me three times. I've shown that to Ron Moorhead, and I've shown that to... Uh, I went to the International Bigfoot Conference two years ago, and I, I took um, my portfolio. Um, I've had so many um, encounters that I did not have an audio recorder on me, and I am kicking myself to this day for not getting one earlier than that. Because, oh my word, some of the stuff I've heard, it's it's just unbelievable. You know, and, and I carry one now wherever I go. I, I've got one in my pocket all the time. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I sure missed out on a lot of opportunities, but heck, there's there's always the future. There's always a chance that it'll happen again. Absolutely. This, this place, yeah, yeah, this place that I is now my main research area. It it is really rich. And, and hot in, in evidence. Um, I, it always seems that I run into them when I go up there. I've kind of figured out their patterns of, of uh, movement. There's a large reservoir nearby, and they hang out there during the summertime. And then they, in the fall, they move over to where my hunting camp was set up, and they, they kind of make a circular pattern. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. They're, they're, uh, I'd say there's probably four or five members of this clan. That's what I, I from the footprints I've found. Mm-hmm. I've, and, and I've gone, I found um, footprints in the snow. <clears throat> I, uh, I busted up there in the middle of w- winter in uh, February, and it was, my truck was the only tires 
tracks through this road. I mean, uh, I was in four-wheel drive and on low, and I just barely made it back in there. Mm-hmm. And I got out, and I saw this trackway. I saw some tracks running along the fence line, so I walked over to it. And, boy, it was, uh, it was some pretty big pretty big tracks, nice ones, about 17 inches, probably by 8 or 9 inches wide. Right. And I stomped, my, I stomped my foot down next to it and took a picture of that. And it went along the fence line and then crossed over and went back into the into the woods. But I've got pictures of all of that. I try and take photographic evidence as much as I can. So I'll, right, I'll a carry a, a yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a good plan. It's if you you can hide a camera in your hand that you know. Oh, I've yeah. taken some some pretty nice pretty nice pictures of structures in that area that pretty impressive. There's a a I nice have to come a nice visit you. <laughs> oh, you should! Hell, oh my gosh, um, I I could show you this area, and and it's it's really really hot. It's I, I get tree knocks every time I stop, and um, I've heard I've heard their language spoken a couple of different times. It's it's um, pretty cool. I wish I had my audio at that time when I didn't, but. Yeah, they were less than mm, probably does the same thing. You just can't. They might not kill you, but it's like with gorillas. Yeah, I mean, you, want, you want to stand your ground, right? So I turned my back on him, and I walked slowly. And and I it, it was hard to keep my legs from moving faster, but I made this concerted effort to slow my walk down. And as I was walking out, I was looking over my shoulder. Something paralleled me on my left side as I was walking back toward the truck, and I had a good three quarters of a mile walk. So, you know, it, it it wasn't like it was just right around the corner. I I had to keep my composure, and I walked down there, and something followed me all the way to the truck. I could hear it coming through the brush. It was probably, you know, fifty feet up above me, and that brush is so thick you can't see, you know, twenty feet into it. And as soon as I got to my truck, I threw that I still had that club and I threw that club into the back of my truck and hopped in and put my rifle away and looked at my wife and go, You won't believe what just happened and and then I told her on the way as I was driving back to Lewis and that that's that's the two the two times that that they got pretty aggressive. And then I was in I was in close and they were they were all the way around me but I think that if you just keep your composure, you you you'll be okay. Is that is that something that sounds familiar? Yeah, I, absolutely. It's what I do in the field. If there's anything going on, I just maintain my composure, and usually it it gets diffused pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, that clan that I've been interacting with. They, uh, I, I pick apples, and, and it's always wild apples. I never take um, store-bought apples uh, up there. And I, the, the apple tree is probably two or three miles away, so I'm, I'm having a feeling that you know, they know where that tree is, too. But I am using these, I'm using their apples kind of as, as a gift, but sort of saying, here's, here's some some apples you know it's not mm-hmm. i'm not habituating i don't i don't like that whole idea yeah i, I won't either. give them anything but i don't i don't do that. i use their wild i use their natural food source to, to make an offering to them you know i'm trying to get them to where they'll be relaxed and actually show themselves to me because that's what i i want you know I, i'm trying to get them to where they can trust me a little bit mm-hmm. Uh, I go into I go in there usually without a firearm because I think that that deters an awful lot of stuff that could happen. The the apples that I have put out they they've all been taken and a couple of times about eight feet tall I guess around eight hundred pounds it was massive I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. 
it didn't do anything, it didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did, I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello everyone. I'm speaking with Richard today. Richard, how are you? I'm doing really well, thank you. I'm battling a little bit of a cold that I've had this past week, so I hope you'll bear with me a little bit on this. Um, let's just get right to it then. Um, tell me when you had your first encounter and just kind of walk me through everything that's happened since then. Okay. Um, actually, my first encounter was I found a, a footprint. I was setting up a hunting blind in northern Idaho and that overlooked a water hole and I brought my wife and my son with me. It was long, it was way before the hunting season started and I set this blind up and, and I walked down to the pond to sort of check it out, see what kind of animals were there because there was mud around the edges. And I got down there and I saw there was just elk and deer tracks everywhere so I started to skirt the left side of the pond and, and I come up upon this track and I just, it just, totally flabbergasted me because I've always kind of believed in Bigfoot, but when I saw that track, it just it completely cemented the, the whole idea. It, it was an amazing track. The toes, you know, all of that. It's, it, it was the real deal. And I turned and looked at my wife and I said, honey, come down here, bring, me, bring the camera, please. And she came down and I took pictures of it. And, <clears throat> and that, that was, it was an incredible track so to fast forward from there i went um i was heading to uh the casino up by warley idaho and I, that's where i saw my first sighting um, i was on my way to bet the kentucky derby and it was the first saturday in may in 2014 and as i was driving along the road up there by tensid i uh, i always look into the meadows that are really intelligent I do. I I see a lot of uh, examples of it in their structures. You know, they they make some unbelievable structures. I've I've been um, this last year or so. I've expanded my territories. I've been going into Montana. I've been down to Yellowstone. I've got just uh, some fantastic pictures of structures in Yellowstone. I along the stretch of the road there, I, I counted 25 different structures just in like a five-mile stretch, and, and I knew I was in, in it, so I just started to slow down a little bit and look for something very unique. And when I, I found connect, it, I pulled up. Huh? I, should, Pardon me? I, should, I should connect you with, I have people in Idaho and Montana, and I should connect you mm -hmm. with them. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, investigated the Skalkahoe Pass, and I found what I believe is the largest X that, and that it's it's huge. It, it's sixty feet tall. It's and then the the logs that it's made out of that you, you can tell that they were imported because there was a, a log that was laying on the ground that had had that split top that some trees have, and that one one of the X, base of the X was just squirreled, you know, screwed down into that that uh, split part to hold it in place. It, it's cool. I took a picture of, of me, or, do you know who Brian Sullivan is? No, I'm not familiar with him. Yeah, he, he's he's um, in Montana, and I took him to the X, because I wanted somebody else to see to see it, and, and he took a picture of me standing under it. But that's that's a, an amazing structure, and I found some other ones in the Skalkahoe area, so I know there's a lot of activity there, too. Mm-hmm. And, and with all of those fires that happened, you know, in, in and around Hamilton, that I'm sure a lot of uh, Sasquatch got displaced and pushed up and over the mountain on sure. toward the Phillipsburg, the Phillipsburg mm -hmm. side. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I've done I've done uh, Yellowstone. I've been Montana. I've done a little bit in Oregon, but not not a whole lot. And then um, I know it, up here in northern Idaho, there's a, a group that I call the Huckleberry Hill Clan, and mm. that's where I got my audio from. I have over six hours of audio. They walked right right up to my truck and were 
messing around with the audio and walking around it. You can hear him then chirping and 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 um, then the alpha comes in and he's growling and he's just like tearing the heck out of trees. Let me and ask he, you. And then he. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to ask I'll you. I, I'm sure the the audience is interested in hearing some of that audio. Do you have a piece that you'd be willing to put with this recording? No idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot near to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Richard today. Richard, how are you? I'm doing really well, thank you. I'm battling a little bit of a cold that I've had this past week, so I hope you'll bear with me a little bit on this. Um, Let's just get right to it then. Um, Tell me when... You had your first encounter, and just kind of walk me through everything that's happened since then. Okay. Um, actually, my first encounter was I found a, a footprint. I was setting up a hunting blind in northern Idaho, and that overlooked a water hole. And I brought my wife and my son with me. It was long, it was way before the hunting season started, and I set this blind up, and and I walked down to the pond to sort of check it out, see what kind of animals were there, because there was mud around the edges. And I got down there, and I saw there was just elk and deer tracks everywhere, so I started to skirt the left side of the pond, and, and I come up upon this track, and I just it just totally flabbergasted me, because I've always kind of believed in Bigfoot, but when I saw that track, it just it completely cemented the, the whole idea. It, it was an amazing track, the toes, you know, all of that is it, it was the real deal. And I turned and looked at my wife and I said, honey, come down here, bring me, bring the camera, please. And she came down and I took pictures of it. And, and that was, that was, it was an incredible track. So to fast forward from there, I went, um, I was heading to, uh, the casino up by Warley, Idaho. And I, that's where I saw my first sighting. Um, I was on my way to bet the Kentucky Derby, and it was the first Saturday in May in 2014. And as I was driving along the road up there by Tensid, I uh, I always look into the meadows as I'm driving by. There's, you know, there's little finger meadows that go off, you know, in the timbered area. And I just I was always reddish brown, rusty color. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I, pardon me? Yeah, yeah. And and as soon as I saw it, I, uh, I I pulled over and I go, what in the heck was that? And and my wife goes, what? What'd you see? And I go, well, I think I just saw a Sasquatch. And and I turned around and I came back and pulled over and parked and got out of the car and looked up and and it was gone. So whatever I saw there, saw me pull around and and it took off. So I I started to doing research on that and and it seems like maybe 70 or 80 percent of Bigfoot sightings come from cars when people are out driving around. And, yeah, it's about uh, 70 thought, percent along roads. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, that's what I found in, <clears throat> in my research also, is that that's about 70 percent of all sightings are just like what I had. So um, later on that October, that I was getting ready to go elk hunting up in up near Beauville, Idaho, and I have a favorite spot that I like to go to, and I back my trailer in there, and it's an open trailer. I, it, there's no roof on it or anything. It's just one of those little utility trailers. I use it to haul my deer out, and I, I sleep in it overnight. But I got up there the, the night before elk season started, and I set my camp up, and 
was hanging out by myself because I, I hunt by myself. I know a lot of people don't think it's it's a wise idea, but I am way more successful doing it. And uh, I was born and raised, or not born in Alaska, but I was raised in Alaska, and, and I've, I I know you know my way around the woods quite a bit. So I'm <clears throat> I, I had a couple of beers, and I call into my sack, and I'm laying there, and I fall asleep, and about well, maybe two or three in the morning, um, the, the alpha male, I, from what I believe he, what he was, he cut loose with a T-Rex scream less than 100 feet from my trailer, and I could feel the vibrations from his uh, volume. I mean, it, it, I could feel it laying down in my trailer. And so I sat up, and I grabbed my rifle, and I'm looking around like, what in the heck was that? And it it was it was amazing. The just this sheer volume and power of that scream was just God, it just it, it frightened me. And I I laid there until daybreak. I did not get out of my trailer until there was a little bit of light coming up. And when I got up I looked around and I was like, I I'm getting out of here. So I just uh, packed everything up and, and I drove back to Lewiston because I did not know what that was. I started to listen to Bigfoot screams. I can still, this, this crow was flapping his wings up and down like he was trying to fly. Hmm. And I'm looking at him, and, and I'm looking and looking, and I, I'm looking at his feet, and it looks like something had reached around the side of that trunk and had grabbed a hold of his feet. Because, you know, when you hold a chicken by its right. feet and it's flapping its wings, that's what, mm-hmm. the, kind of the same thing I saw. And I'm looking at that crow, and I'm like, what in the world is wrong with him? And he's flapping, and, it, and I, I, kind of, I look, and I, you know, their, their hair is such a color that it just blends into nature so well. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know it's, it's not like a, a red shirt sleeve around that side of that trunk. It was, but I could see something holding his feet, because he just couldn't get his feet right. loose. And he was flapping, and, and then it, that that went on for about 30 seconds. And then then he got loose, and when he flew, he was flying. He was he was flying um, like he was hurt. You know, it was like like he had like he'd been beat up or something. Mm-hmm. And he because his his uh, his wings and the way he was gliding, he only glided. He went maybe oh about 75 feet, and then he landed on the ground. And I, I go, wow, and I, I sort of walked up towards him, and I got up there. I couldn't see him. I just I was looking for him. He was down in some brush, and he recovered and got up and then flew off, but his flight path was pretty pretty shaky. It wasn't it wasn't a normal flight path because he, he had obviously went through something. I, I I wish I knew what happened, but that's that's what I saw, and I it looked like something grabbed him from behind that tree. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Not that particular sort of thing. Uh, it was interesting that he got away. Yeah, I don't know why. You know, um, maybe maybe he had some feathers plucked from him. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But the way he flew off, it was like. He was injured in a way, but not to where he still couldn't fly. Because I have a feather story that's pretty interesting. Okay. That 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 tree, that place that I um, give them apples at, the, the wild apples. Well, one time I pulled in and I walked down there to check see if everything was gone because I put toys out there too I'll throw a couple of cars or something like that and, and they've never touched them they they took one of the Legos one time and threw it about two or three feet away but that could have been anything it could have been a, a mouse